An American carrier battle group is one of the most powerful combat unit ever created and the carrier itself, it is unsinkable. Uh, well, actually, no, there are ways to sink it, but it is very, very, very difficult to do so. And it might take up to four weeks. Let me tell you a story. The 19th of April 2005, the USS America CV-66 left Philadelphia under tow. Till then it was moored at the inactive ship facility waiting for its destiny. In fact, it was an old carrier in very bad shape, impossible to put in reserve or reactivate. However, it had a feature that was useful for one last mission, the way it was built. In fact, the CV-66 was originally designed to be a nuclear-powered carrier, but it was completed with conventional propulsion. The ship, though, retained an internal design with commonalities with the soon-to-be Nimitz class. Exactly what? We don't know, it's classified, but it was a good target if you wanted to test how hardy and resilient it was to attacks. So the US Navy towed the ship 300 miles off the Virginia coast for a classified sink-ex, which is a training exercise where you sink a ship. The ship survived four weeks of beating, to the surprise of the Navy, and in the end it was necessary to sink it with demolition charges because every weapon failed to significantly damage it. A testament to the resilience of the US carriers, which demonstrated to be unsinkable. And since the America was old, Nimitz and Ford must be even better. Well, actually, not really. This is the story how it is often told, but it is not credible and we will explain why at the end when we will discuss the passive protection. But before delving deep into why a US carrier is indeed almost impossible to sink, just a few seconds to let you know that this video is sponsored by you. Yes, you that you watch the YouTube adverts, even if they are annoying, you who become part of the Patreon community or join the channel with the button below, you that support the channel financially by any of the other means available, on YouTube or off YouTube. Patrons and members have a view of the backstage with posts, sources and dedicated videos that explain what is going on. They also have a direct channel with me if you want to ask or discuss anything. Thank you for what you do. All of this would not be possible without you. If you consider supporting the channel, all the links are in the description. The best way to sink a US carrier is from underwater. One or two torpedoes that cause a few degrees listing are enough for a mission kill. A torpedo that disables two propellers is enough to prevent reaching the speed to launch aircraft. I would expect that a salvo of four heavy torpedoes could do enough damage to put the ship at risk of sinking. Consider that today, with underwater autonomous vehicles, you may not even need a real submarine evading all the anti-submarine measures to get into launch position to do the job. However, this is not the point I want to make. I am not the best person to explain the underwater dimension. I'm more interested in what may happen above water, which means aircraft and missiles. A carrier battle group is expected to control an area of about a thousand nautical miles centered on the carrier itself. It does so with sensors, either on ships, on aircraft, or other assets available to the US armed forces. The carrier is an element of the combat network where command, weapons and sensor fusion nodes are co-located. I explained all of this in an old video that, if you haven't, you should watch because it is essential to understand the modern American way of war. So anything attacking a carrier need to go through these thousand miles undetected or unskated. And it is a tall order indeed. And by the way, these thousand miles do extend into space too. It is a bit less than a thousand, but a carrier group also has anti-ballistic and anti-hypersonic weapons. The actual effectiveness, uh, particularly against hypersonics, is probably debatable, uh, but let's move on. 
we could do some very complex scenarios with various carrier group compositions and various weapons attacking, but there is a simple methodology to assess the theoretical maximum effort that would be required to sink a carrier. So let's consider a modern 2025 carrier group composed by the carrier itself, two Ticonderoga-class cruisers, and four Arleigh Burke. Actually, having two Ticonderogas is quite a luxury because there are only nine in active service today. The Arleigh Burke could be Flight 2A because the bulk of the Flight 3 is still work in progress as we speak in 2025. The carrier wing currently features four combat squadrons, each one with 10 to 12 F-18 EF. Some carriers can replace one F-18 squadron with 10 F-35C, but for our purpose we stick with the Super Hornet because currently they are picking up the purpose of fleet defense while the F-35 have mainly an attack role. So let's say that there are 48 Hornets on board, all available, which is not realistic, but we want to put the carrier group in the best conditions possible. And to do so, we also assume that the sensors are working perfectly and they can accurately characterize all the tracks and contacts within the 1000 mile range without missing one. So we assume perfect knowledge of the battle space. We are also assuming, for sake of simplicity, that the attack is conducted by aerial platforms aircraft, so no SSGNs, no surface units with anti-ship missiles, no fast boats, nothing. In practice, the name of the game in this case is saturation, that is how many attacking platforms and weapons will be needed to exhaust the available defenses if they work perfectly. This will give us the theoretical maximum effort. We start with the F-18, assuming that they will attack the launch platforms. These could be bombers or tactical aircraft or some type. These will be engaged at long range in the region between 400 and 500 miles from the carrier. Which is a bit of a stretch, but it is not too unrealistic. 48 Super Hornets in air-to-air -air configuration, each carrying 6 Amram and 2 AIM-9X, can hit a total of 348 targets, assuming a 100% effectiveness, which again is never the case, but we want to put our carrier group in the best possible conditions. After that, it is possible that each Super Hornet will reach one attacker and it will gun it down. It is 48 more platforms for a total of 432 targets. What remains of the attackers will fire anti-ship missiles at the carrier group. The two Ticonderoga feature 128 vertical launch tubes, Mark 41, for weapons of various types. Not all of them are available because the missile loadout varies depending on the mission. In this case, we speculate a very defensively oriented configuration. Only eight cells are occupied by the surface attack clams, while 120 remain available for defensive weapons. 10 more cells are occupied by SM3s, anti-ballistic missiles, which are ineffective in this specific case. 110 cells remain, each one potentially hosting an SM6 or an SM2 of some variant. However, we assume that 10 cells are loaded with ESSM short-range missiles, which are quad-packed in the vertical launcher. This leaves us with a 140 missiles that can be used to defend against anti-ship missiles at various ranges. Assuming 100% effectiveness, as usual, this is the max number of anti-ship missiles that can be destroyed by attack on the Roga. All other weapons do not count because they are point defense weapons that can only defend the ship itself. The Arleigh Burke destroyers have 96 Mark 41 vertical launch cells, but not all of them are available like in the case of the Ticonderoga. Even in this case, we assume a defensively biased configuration where only 10 cells are occupied by TLAM cruise missiles. Furthermore, 8 cells are occupied by ASROC, which is an anti-submarine missile, and 8 more cells are occupied by SM3's anti-ballistics. This leaves 70 Mark 41 available, 10 of which are occupied by quad-packed ESSM. 
This brings us to a neat total of 100 missiles usable against an anti-ship missile attack. The entire carrier group escorts, always assuming 100% effectiveness, can defend against 680 anti-ship missiles. But this is not the end because a carrier features some autonomous defensive capabilities. There are three 20mm Phalanx Seaways, and I assume that each one could stop three missiles. Furthermore, there are 16 ESSM missiles and 42 rolling airframe point defense missiles. Assuming the usual 100% effectiveness, this adds further 67 missiles for a total of 747 anti-ship missiles. This is the theoretical maximum that might be needed to overcome the carrier group's escort and the aircraft carrier defenses with anti-ship missiles. Just for the kicks, let's assume that the attacker platform is a large bomber like the Chinese H6, each one carrying four weapons, which seems reasonable. Sometimes they can carry more, but whatever. To launch 747 missiles, 187 platforms would be needed. Added to the 432 shot down by the Hornets, it makes 619 platforms. Obviously, all of these need to be armed because you don't know which one will be shot down, and this will require 2,476 anti-ship missiles. This is what it takes to sink a carrier, 619 aircraft and 2,476 anti-ship missiles. It is easy to understand that these are World War II numbers. But this doesn't look like a 21st century order of battle. We live in a world where the Chinese can produce anything in enormous quantities, but these levels are hardly within reach for them to... Anyway, this is just a theoretical exercise, and an actual scenario could be very different. We ignore the effect of electronic warfare, and effectiveness won't be 100% on both sides. However, unless the effectiveness is very low, which we may safely suppose it won't be the case, we are still talking hundreds of platforms and missiles to go through the carrier group defenses. We could actually do the same exercise for anti-ballistic defense, but now you know the drill, so please try it yourself and let me know in the comments below. Now, there is something very interesting left to explore. What happens when the carrier is actually hit? So let's get back to the syntax of the America carrier where we started from. The story that it survived four weeks of pounding is misleading. Most likely it was attacked with single shots to see the effect of a single specific weapon. So after each attack, most likely a crew of engineers boarded the vessel to assess the damage. You also have to remember that the ship had no fuel, no oil, no munitions on board, so there was little that could catch fire. And in the end, they probably used demolition charges to scuttle it, just to avoid using some expensive torpedoes. Why I'm saying so? Uh, well, it becomes very clear if we check out this picture, which is the only one in the public domain and the largest version, which is actually hanging somewhere in the Pentagon. There is probably a hole in the flight deck between the two bow catapults, and that's basically it. The island is still intact, the flight deck is mostly intact. It doesn't seem a ship that took a pounding for four weeks. Probably there are more holes in the sides that are not visible, but it is not the destroyed wreck that keeps floating despite a deluge of explosive. While I'm sure that the Navy got good data out of this experiment, there is no specific lesson we can learn about the survivability of carriers by what has been released in the public domain. 
So is there anything that could teach us what happens when a carrier is hit? Well, it turns out that there is. In 2021, the Naval College Review published a long piece by Stephen Wills and John Lehman about the viability of aircraft carriers. I quote, USS Oriskany CV-34, USS Forrestal CV-59, and USS Enterprise CVN-65 all experienced exploding bombs and severe fires that killed many sailors. Yet, all returned to port for repairs under their own power. Enterprise later was assessed to have survived the equivalent of six heavyweight Soviet cruise missiles strikes in the course of its accident, but could have resumed air operations in several hours had repair capacity not been immediately available. These incidents tell us that a carrier is very resilient. For example, in the case of the Enterprise, a Zuni rocket accidentally detonated while hanging under a Phantom on the stern of the ship. This started a fuel leak that catch fire. Other Zuni rockets pierced the flight deck and the fuel started leaking in the hangar, where several Mark 82 bombs detonated, blowing eight holes in the flight deck. 28 sailors died, a few hundred were injured and 15 aircraft were lost. The ship returned to Pearl Harbor and it took only 51 days to repair the damage and go back to sea. From the pictures we can see that the forward part of the flight deck is intact and the landing area was damaged but probably not beyond a makeshift repair. So, why carriers are so resilient? Well, it is by size and design. The actual construction details are classified, but they all have double hulls and anti-torpedo bulkheads. The ship is also large and the sheer size makes it difficult to sink because there are several spaces that can be isolated and provide reserve buoyancy. Areas that are subject to splinters are protected with Kevlar composite armor a few centimeters thick, and the damage control systems are extremely advanced widely diffused and the sailors are all trained in damage control. So sinking a carrier is a very difficult task and it would probably require several torpedoes or several anti-ship missiles. Obviously achieving a mission kill is much easier because damage in particular to aircraft might render the carrier unusable for operations for a long time. Several anti-ship missiles could do that and even if the flight operations might resume, the number of sorties and all the other activities required to execute useful missions may be severely hindered. So, even if you, in the end, manage hitting a carrier, well, you may have effects, but the deal is not done. So, thank you very much for watching this video. It has been a honor and a privilege having had your attention. An enormous thank you to all those who are supporting the channel on Patreon by being a member or by any of the other means available. You are absolute stars. Without you, this would not be possible. And if you can't support the channel, please do it only if you can afford it. You can always subscribe if you haven't yet or hit the bell, leave a comment, interact in some way with the videos because it helps with the algorithm immensely. So this is it for today. Thank you very much for watching and see you next time.